Lakeland Public Television and area news partners are proud to present Debate Night 2012, a look at our area legislative candidates. And now, the State House of Representatives District 5A debate. Your moderator tonight is Roy Blackwood. Good evening. Welcome to Debate Night 2012, 11 debates over four nights. Tonight's debate is at Lakeland Public Television Studio in Bemidji, and this 8 o'clock debate is for House District 5A, Mr. John Purcell, Democratic candidate, and Mr. Larry Howes, the Republican candidate. We also have with us a panel of journalists, Mr. Dennis Wyman, Lakeland Public Television News Director, Mr. Steve Wagner, Bemidji Pioneer Editor, and Mr. Scott Hall, KAXE News Director. Rules for the debate this evening are as follows. Each candidate will have three minutes for an opening comment, uh, and the beginning has been chosen randomly in advance. The person who will start has been chosen randomly in advance. The panel members will then ask questions. Some will be their own questions. Others will be gleaned from uh, public input. The candidates will rotate the order in which they speak, beginning with the opening comments and finishing with the closing comments. Each candidate will get two minutes to answer the question, and then each candidate will have a one-minute rebuttal opportunity. Questions will continue until, or, until we are about 50 minutes into the debate, at which time we'll move to closing comments. Those closing comments will comprise two minutes from each candidate. Are there any questions about the rules? Hearing none, we'll move on to the, uh, to the opening comments, and the first opening comment will be from Mr. Purcell. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Um, this is uh, an interesting time we find ourselves in, uh, uh, in the state of Minnesota, and uh, of course, uh, nationally as well. And uh, we've got some tough decisions ahead of us. Uh, I uh, have had the good fortune of serving in the legislature for four years, representing District 4A. Uh, now a new district uh, labeled 5A, basically the same geographic area, uh, a few changes. Uh, but you know, this has uh, been quite a challenge over the last four years for me. Uh, uh, the first two years I served uh, under uh, Governor Pawlenty, and the Democrats were in the majority in both houses. And in these last two years, we've had Governor Dayton uh, a Democrat as the governor, and we've had majority uh, Republican in the House and the Senate. And so I've seen all sides of the spectrum, I believe, or nearly so, uh, certainly a good variety. And you know, when it comes to what we're looking for in this district that I represent and the families uh, uh, that, that live in this district, we're looking for a fair system of taxation and we have our difficulties up here because of all the public land we have. And uh, so we need the payment in lieu of taxes to be coming through and they've been cut. We need the local government aid to be coming through and that's been cut. And in this latest uh, round down there in, the, in, the, in St. Paul, we've seen the homestead tax credit done away with and that really hurt uh, just about everybody in this district. So um, we've got a lot of work to do and uh, uh, I'm, here tonight to talk about these issues and, and, uh, and several others as well and uh, just let folks know uh, what my experiences have been and where I think we need to go. Thank you, sir. Mr. Howes, your opening comments. Well, thank you, uh, Lakeland Public Television and Bemidji Pioneer and Scott Hall from the radio. And uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Scott and I are made for radio. So uh, tonight will be a little bit different, but uh, uh, I was born and raised in South Minneapolis and slowly moved north and my wife kept saying that I'd move her to the Canadian border and when I got to the Hackensack Walker area I decided that would be our home and now she's got her heels dug in and that's where we're going to stay. We've been married 47 years, five children, six grandchildren and we really enjoy, enjoy North Central Minnesota. I've served in the legislature for 14 years under three governors. I've seen what uh, Mr. Purcell has seen. Uh, Governor Ventura, which you really never could predict. Governor Pawlenty, you could. Uh, Governor Dayton, you, you can predict. 
And it's been, I've been in the majority and in the minority. Uh, right now I'm in the majority. I, I'm the chair of the Capital Investment Committee. I serve on Ways and Means, the Jobs and Economic Development and Finance Committee, and the Rules Committee. It's been enjoyable uh, working for the people of Minnesota. It's been an experience. I really believe that everybody, if they could, should do it in some fashion, either work for local governments, uh, townships, cities, state, even federal government. It's quite an experience. You learn a lot about life. And life is, is, at the Capitol isn't that much different than a church council or a student council, uh, school board. We all have difficulties. And it starts at the top with the federal government. If there's economic problems uh, worldwide or with the federal government, they cut our funds. Uh, and then that, that trickles down to the state. And if we have problems, we cut the funds of local governments. And when you're in the majority, you have to take tough, hard votes because you have to govern. And it's been difficult the past two years, but I don't think it's been impossible. I found that uh, working with Governor Dayton, even though he's from a different party and a little bit different philosophy, he's very, been very fair to me, been very fair when I've sat down and talked to him about bonding bills and about taxes and about everything else. Uh, sometimes we've agreed, sometimes we haven't. In 2011, when we came to kind of loggerheads and didn't know what to do, we did have the government shut down, but in the end, uh, the governor and the leaders from both houses, from all four parties sat down and agreed to uh, a remedy and that was taken care of, and uh, now we're living with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howes. Moving on to questions, the first question this evening will be from Mr. Dennis Wyman, Lakeland News. Thanks, Roy, and thank you both for participating tonight and helping to fill in our viewers with your views on a variety of topics. Uh, second debate in a row now tonight where we have two incumbents facing each other. First time in the 12 years we've been doing these debates that we've run into this situation, which of course came about through redistricting. But it also allows us to have the opportunity to have two lawmakers who have a record and have done some, some things at the state capitol already. I, I'd like to have each of you assess your performance uh, so far. And, and what you see as your strengths as a legislator and perhaps some areas that you feel you could stand to work on. Thank you, Mr. Wyman. The first answer to that question will come from Mr. Howes. Well, thank you, Dennis. Uh, I guess my strengths would be uh, the reputation I have in St. Paul of working with both parties, working with all concerned parties. Uh, while I don't like to compromise uh, on beliefs that the people of my district want me to represent, I should rephrase that, I won't back down on what my people want, but learning to compromise is finding common ground, and usually 80% of the time you can find common ground with the other side of the aisle. And sometimes it's even difficult to find common ground with your own party, but you find that common ground, you work at that, and then you see how far you can go from there. Uh, I think I've done a very good job. Uh, in 2011, I was awarded uh, Legislator of the Year by Politics in Minnesota, and that was quite an honor. I enjoyed that. And this year, I was uh, awarded Legislator of the Year by the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. They don't just do that because they do it because you earned it. And I appreciate that. And uh, one of my uh, closest allies down in St. Paul was Representative Rukavina. Uh, from the Iron Range, who's since retired. And my wife often said, how can you possibly agree with Representative Rukavina on anything? And, you know, it wasn't really that difficult on 80% of the things we agreed on because we we're in North, northern Minnesota. Northern Minnesota has a lot of issues that are the same, be it mi logging, mining, fishing, uh, the environment. It wasn't that difficult. And, and the subjects that we disagreed on, we sort of stayed away from those or try to keep, creep closer and, and come to some conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. House. Mr. Purcell. Thank you, Roy. <clears throat> Thank you, Dennis, for the question. I, you know, I, I've uh, tried to assess in my own uh, mind what I think my strengths and weaknesses are. I do believe I can, I can stick with my convictions fairly well and have uh, expressed that on the House floor. I've spoken to a number of issues uh, <coughs> over uh, especially the last couple of years when we've had some very challenging situations develop. Uh, and I, I, uh, I have found it uh, 
Um, sometimes difficult to work with uh, uh, my fellow legislators and sometimes uh, uh, quite easy. And I guess that's kind of what you might say is par for the course. Um, but one of the bigger difficulties that I've uh, experienced is in this last legislative session and, and, it, and it was very challenging. I think it was challenging for all of us uh, for sure and the government shut down and you know there's not a whole lot to whole lot of reward when you're going through a, a biennium that's the uh, government is shut down and we end up with uh, you know we've, we've, we borrowed money from from schools and, and uh, you know we've got a we've got a, a deficit we're going back to uh, in 2013-14 here but uh, it, one of the things has is, is, is certainly been uh, trying to overcome some of the uh, bad legislation and what are we going to say about uh, legislation when it does come up. Do we, do we really speak uh, our convictions about uh, some of these uh, legislative activities? Do we really go after some of these things? And I think I do. And uh, you know aquatic invasive species was mentioned earlier and that's a, that's a pretty big deal for us up here in in northern Minnesota, protecting our, our lakes and waters. And uh, it was something I really tried to go after. So that's just an example. I think I'm, I'm good at that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Howes, any rebuttal? I don't think so. OK. Mr. Purcell, anything else? No. OK, then we'll move on to the next question. And that will come from Mr. Steve Wagner of the Bemidji Pioneer. Thanks for joining us tonight, gentlemen. The big difference from the two sides of the political spectrum seems to be whether government does too much to people or too much for people. Please talk about how you see Minnesota government in that respect today and where it should be. What changes, if any, would you suggest? Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, first answer to that question will be from Mr. Purcell. Thanks, Roy. And uh, thank you for that question. I, I, uh, you know, that, you hear a lot about that if you sit through committee and, and legislative, uh, uh, on the legislature on the floor of the House, uh, and I'm sure the Senate as well, about uh, what does good governance really mean and, uh, and how much government do we need. And I, I, uh, I, I try and think about that, and, and I honestly, I go back to the days when I was a, a young fella and, uh, and uh, had a mother a school teacher. Well, that's a... That's a government worker. And uh, I had an uncle that worked for the Soil Conservation Service, so that's a government worker. And, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, being a public servant, a public worker, government worker, that was, a, that was something to aspire to. And we certainly seem to have turned that on its head um, and in, in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, government workers get uh, just uh, maltreated, uh, I think quite wrongfully so uh, um, by those who think, well, the government's too big. And uh, so I, I think we need to refocus. I, there definitely are, are services that uh, our government needs to be there for us, you know, it, it, our transportation, our infrastructure, et cetera. And of course, you know, moving up uh, in the larger arena, our, our defense, our military. And as, as a proud veteran, I can't forget that. But it, our government definitely uh, needs to be there for us for the basics, and and I think we've endeavored to uh, to bring that about. But we have to be there for the children, for the education system, and we've really gone backwards on that in the last uh, ten years or so in Minnesota, and we've we've cut back on spending that we should be putting out here in Minnesota. LGA and PILT they talked about earlier, and getting these funds out here to Minnesota so outstate northern Minnesota has a good opportunity uh, for our kids to get a good education. That's just an example, I guess. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Mr. Howes. You know, I, I, I hate to say this, but I'm going to agree with John on a lot of the of things that he talked about. Uh, the real main responsibility of Minnesota government is schools, educate our children, roads and bridges, public <coughs> facilities like wastewater, drinking water. And we do have to have rules and we do have to have laws. Now, some would say we maybe have too many laws, too many rules. And I think we probably do have too many rules in some areas, but we also need to have, and I think Minnesota's one of the top states, is recreational activity. And what I mean by that are the outdoors, the forests, the lakes, the streams. My wife loves to kayak. Uh, in fact, she was just in Bemidji on, uh, yesterday kayaking from uh, up 
to, to the head of the Mississippi headwaters. And, and biking, we have a lot of trails, that's great. That does cost money, government pays for it. Uh, do we do too much of that? Personally, I don't think so. Uh, there may be some waste here and there, but uh, I really think we do a good job. If you go to the uh, state of Texas and, and if you like to hunt, you have to pay a small fortune just to hunt because there's no real public property. Where in Minnesota, we have a lot of public lands where we can hunt, we have a lot of lakes where we can fish. Now, with regard to too much government, maybe we've got too many rules uh, um, in, from the PCA, maybe we've got too many rules with permitting in many different areas, uh, building codes, different things that can be looked at and looked at again. Too many different agencies that don't talk to each other, they don't work together. Sometimes you have to go through two or three different bureaucracies just to get one project done. I think the state of Minnesota is doing a reasonably good job in spite of the economy. Uh, I know that our unemployment is well below the national average. Jobs are coming back uh, b above the national average. So for the most part, I think Minnesota is a great place to live. People still move here. And I certainly still enjoy living in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. House. Mr. Purcell, any uh, rebuttal? No. Okay, then anything else, Mr. Purcell, Mr. House? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we'll move on to uh, Mr. Hall for the next question. Thanks, Roy. Two years ago when we were here, we were talking about uh, f five or six billion dollar deficit. Uh, both of you were looking at uh, if you were reelected, and you were. And, and I know that the by in and before that, we also were looking at deficits. And over those last four to six to eight years, the state has balanced the budget um, with a lot of one-time uh, borrowing from school funds, uh, from shifting uh, and taking uh, local government aid away from local businesses, or excuse me, local um, government units, counties, and municipalities. And um, also we've seen property taxes go up a lot uh, locally to make up the difference in the loss of local government aid. So is there a, a more stable, less one-time approach to government budgeting that you think we can get back to? Thank you, Mr. Hall. First uh, answer to that question will be for Mr. Howes. Oh, I'm sorry, I was, thought I was second. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, yes, it was very difficult to balance the budget, and we did use uh, gimmicks. Uh, I'd have to be honest and say gimmicks have been used for the, at least the past eight years. Uh, there's no getting around it. Uh, that's what's been done. Both parties are, are at fault. I can't blame Democrats or blame Republicans any more than I can blame anybody else. Uh, I know that. Uh, with regard to property taxes, I just got this in the mail today from the Minnesota cities, and uh, a lot of talk about property taxes. And this is what the counties and the cities wanted us to do, get rid of the homestead credit, because they thought using the exclusion and doing it that way would make a more stable funding source for cities and counties. And now it appears that it's not working the way they wanted to. But Minnesota's property tax ranking right now is number 25, so we're dead center uh, in the nation. It's 2.6, average property tax in Minnesota per family is 2.6% of the income. And this, this thought that uh, the school shift, gosh, that's been going on for at least six years, maybe longer. If you've served in the legislature for four, for two to six years, you have voted for a school shift at one time or another. I'm sure when I was in the minority, I voted against it. In the majority, I voted for it. When you're in the majority, you have to make those tough votes and, because you have to govern. Now, the governor wanted a 50-50 split on, on uh, the school shift. The Republicans wanted a 730, and we compromised at 60-40. Uh, Is it a good deal? Absolutely not, but we did uh, pass a bill to pay back $700 million of that shift, but the governor vetoed it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Purcell, your answer. Thanks, Roy. Um, thanks, Scott, for that question. I, I, I just want to, I want to start out by, by saying, um, it's interesting to take a look at this, uh, and, and and how it's being presented to us in, uh, I guess, in this uh, election cycle and the, the the budget deficit and the way budgeting has been done, and uh, I think many of us in, in the audience uh, have uh, been told that uh, 
that the Republicans created a, a billion dollar surplus uh, in the last biennium. And um, I, I think that's, that's really creative, uh, to say the least. Um, and, and certainly uh, school shifts and these things that have, that have been done, gimmicks, and I think they are gimmicks, and this has been a, been a hard, hard lesson to, to really to come to understand about how St. Paul can work. Uh, those things have been going on for sure, but, but then to turn around and say, well, we shifted money, borrowed money from the schools, uh, and, and now all of a sudden we have a surplus. We just, it was put on the credit card. That's what the Republicans did, and, and in fact, with the $2.4 billion school shift and about $1.1 billion projected deficit for 2013-14 and another billion in inflation, we've got a $4.5 billion deficit looking at us again. So we really didn't get very far, and we've got to get back to a budgeting approach that I've, since I have said I was going to go down there and I got elected to go down there, a balanced approach and we're going to have to take a good look at the revenue stream and we're going to have to take a good look at where we can gain efficiencies and uh, I agree with Governor Dayton that the uh, we need to take a look at how much the wealthy are paying and they need to pay their fair share of taxes so that's that's one area I really am very willing to look at. Thank you sir. Mr. Haas I sense that you might want to rebut this time. Uh, a little bit yes. 30 seconds? Uh, minute. Oh, a minute. Well, I don't think I'll take that long. But with regard to uh, uh, the, the budget deficit and the surplus, according to Minnesota Management and Budget, they're the ones that oversee all of the funds in the state of Minnesota, we have a $1.4 billion surplus, period, according to law. Even Lori Sturdivant uh, from the Star Tribune, which is, uh, She's a little bit liberal in her writing, has agreed that $1.4 billion is the surplus according to Minnesota law. And on top of that, with regard to the Homestead credit, the Department of Revenue, the House Research staff, which is nonpartisan, and Governor Dayton's top tax uh, aide said that the Homestead credit change did not, there's no data to say that that has uh, changed property taxes whatsoever. Rebuttal, Mr. Purcell. Um, well, it's a more creative thought processes, I guess, because there's only a surplus if you don't consider the credit card $2.4 billion that was taken from the schools. And, and uh, you know, it's just uh, just gimmicks, playing with words here. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm telling you straight up like it is, and uh, we have a, a, a deficit, $4.5 billion, that's coming at us when we get back down there, and uh, everybody's going to realize that. So... Uh, you know, it can, can uh, try and mince words about, uh, about, well, legally and, well, you know, we're state representatives, you know, we aren't trying to be attorneys here. And, and uh, the, the homestead credit, doing away with the homestead credit increased property taxes of 95% of Minnesotans. There's no two ways about it. And it, that was the silliest thing that could have been done, and we tried to talk the Republicans out of doing it. So uh, that's just... Uh, just a few things that uh, we need to go back down there and improve on. Thank you, sir. Next question, Mr. Wyman. Let's talk education. What do you see as the biggest challenges facing your district in regards to education? We hear talk about the disparity between metro funding for education and, and rural funding. Uh, what can be done at the state level and, and what do you see as the biggest priorities for, for yourself uh, if elected? Your answer, Mr. Purcell. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, you know, just to kind of go with one of the disparities uh, aspect of your question there first, Dennis. Uh, I've carried a bill several times now uh, to try and fix that transportation uh, disparity up here for uh, local school district 31, and and uh, haven't been successful yet. And of course, there's a fixed amount of money uh, in that pot. And so if we, uh, if we get money out of it for school district 31, somebody else is gonna lose. And that's, uh, that's just how the give and take works. Um, but uh, definitely, uh, and as you uh, know, I mean, school district 31 is, uh, is the size of, uh, you know, a significant part of the Metro. So we, we bust kids a long ways and a lot of the rural districts too. So it's a big deal for us. And at, uh, you know, at $4 diesel, it's a real big deal. Uh, so 
you know, we, we fought to uh, increase the, the per pupil uh, um, funding. Uh, we wanted 50 more dollars for that. And ended up, uh, we ended up out of this session with a $44 million cut. Inflation has cut into our, our, the cost what we, for our schools, about 12.5% inflation. Uh, so these challenges, and they're, they're really being picked up by the property tax. These are getting back to where the referendums have to be increased, and the referendums have increased from, uh, if I remember right, from in 2003, about $350 per pupil, and it's over $1,000 now in 2012 per pupil. That's the referendum. So we're going the wrong way. The property taxes are having to come up higher and higher to meet these needs. We have to get back to where we have the state helping us out, especially up here in northern Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Mr. Howes. Well, de dealing with education funding in rural Minnesota is more of a uh, metro versus uh, rural legislator than it is uh, probably Democrat versus Republican, but that does cut into there. Um, one thing we've tried real hard on, it came very close a couple years ago, I think it was three years ago, very close, is getting those cabin owners back on the levees. It was almost completed, but <clears throat> excuse me, we didn't quite get there. I'd like to try it again. Um, well, we try it every year, but we don't seem to succeed. But that makes a big difference when we have local operating levies. If we could get those cabin owners and recreational property back on that tax roll, that would help a great deal. Uh, with regard to uh, transportation, it's very skewed. If you look at the uh, Richfield School District, they get far more money for their transportation needs per pupil than we do here in Bemidji, and we put all the miles on up in here in, in Bemidji versus what they put on in Richfield. In fact, in House File 2949, when it first left the floor, uh, I had a $250,000 grant for the Bemidji School District for transportation funding. Now, I voted for it, Representative Ward voted for it, uh, the, the um, lead Democrat, uh, Mindy Greiling, voted for it, but my opponent voted against that bill. And when it went to conference committee, uh, it was taken out in conference committee because they said if the local representative didn't vote for it, then there was no point in keeping it in the bill. So there are many things we can do, and we have to just keep working at it, and rural legislators have to figure out a way to, I don't know, reach out with suburban people to, to uh, have the numbers over the metro area people. Thank you, Mr. Howes. Rebuttal, Mr. Purcell. Well, I just would say regarding the bill that uh, Representative Howell just spoke to, um, you know, uh, if, if it would have been the bill that I was carrying, it would have been, uh, it would have been, I, I believe, a, a, a go all the way. Um, and uh, I'm, but I can't, I can't speak to the particulars of the bill. Um, but I, but I can tell you that uh, that my fight for uh, education in northern Minnesota has been, uh, has been second to none, and and I'm going to keep after it if I'm fortunate to get reelected. Thank you, Mr. Howes. Anything else? Well, I won't take away uh, the fact, John, that, that you're, you're not a fighter. You are a fighter. I'll agree with you. But you did let this one slip by. You didn't vote for it. I don't know why. Uh, and the bill did become law. It was signed by the governor this year uh, towards the end of session. Um, I guess you'd have to read the bills entirely to make sure you don't make that mistake again. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question, Mr. Wagner. As you both know, there are two amendments on this year's general election ballot, uh, one addressing marriage, the other one with uh, voter ID. How do you stand on each of those amendments and, and, uh, and why? And on the voter ID uh, amendment, uh, what provisions do you favor to implement it if it is passed? Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Mr. Howes. I voted for both of those amendments and I support them both. Uh, the people of my district uh, overwhelmingly support the vo voter ID, the photo ID, photo ID. And I would say in, with the marriage amendment, probably 60% of the voters in my district support the marriage amendment. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, there is such a thing as civil unions which are legal, binding, and can work well, and I'm not opposed to that whatsoever. Uh, it's one of those issues, I think, both of them are, that we needed to put to the people. 
uh, it, it's pretty important. Now with regard to the photo ID, I believe, like others believe, that voting is a right. It's a right if you're a citizen of the United States of America. It's a right if you're 18 years old. And it's a right if you live in that particular precinct where you're going to vote. The only thing we're asking is that people show they are who they are. And when you do that, that's got your address on there. It's got the precinct. Uh, I don't see a problem with it. I, I know uh, the, the tribal government believes there was a problem with it, but in 2001, or no, 2002, I passed a bill that allowed tribal IDs to be used for voting in Minnesota. And the, the constitutional amendment says government issued photo ID. Tribal government is a government that is a valid ID. And I also believe that uh, rural Minnesota that do mail-in ballots, there is a, a, a very easy way to do that, but there's not enough time to explain it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Purcell. Well, certainly we spent uh, a lot of time, uh, maybe an inordinate amount of time, on these, uh, these two amendments uh, to the Constitution. And you know, the Constitution is, uh, is a pretty special piece of, of uh, pretty special document. And uh, to think that we're, uh, we're proposing to amend them without fully understanding what we're doing in either case, and particularly, let me start with the voter ID. Um, number one, we've heard over and over again that voter fraud, which photo ID is intended to fix, is virtually non-existent in Minnesota. Virtually non-existent. And uh, so trying to fix a problem and that doesn't exist is, it just doesn't seem like it's good taxpayer dollars. Yeah, being spent and this is going to if it passes it's going to cost tens of millions of dollars upwards of a hundred million dollars why we want to do that and and not you know spend that money on our schools or something else is is beyond me uh, and this is coming from uh republicans i mean they they passed this because they didn't want the governor to have a shot at it because he would have vetoed that both of these amendments so that's why they did this that's why they went the way they did um it is a threat to the tribal ID, this, this voter ID, this photo ID. Um, it says the, 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 the th it says government uh, issued, we offer an amendment that should say government approved. Then that would have, a, we speak for the state government, we don't speak for any other government. And when Representative Howe says, well it says government, government issued, that means state. We don't speak for any other government. We don't speak for the feds or any other government. That means state government. So that's, that's, that's certainly one of the things, and, and uh, um, we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit more here about this, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Howe. Rebuttal? Yeah, I would. Um, the tribal ID is government issued, pure and simple. The United States government is government. Government issued there it would, be, would be there. Minnesota government is government issued. Tribal ID is a government, government issued. But I will agree that the Constitution is a sacred document. I also believe that so is marriage and so is the right to vote. Thank you, Mr. Howes. Ms. Purcell. Well, you know, we offered the Republicans, the Democrats offered the Republicans the opportunity. If they really wanted this photo ID thing, we said, let's bring a laptop computer to every polling place. Let's take a picture of that voter when they come in there. <coughs> they wouldn't do it. And they wouldn't do it because that wasn't their intent. The intent of that photo ID is not to prove who they are voters, who the voters are. If it was, that would have worked just fine, would have cost much less money. But the Republicans would not accept that. So that's a, 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 a real uh, uh, ding in the shield there that they're holding up, trying to say that the photo ID is the answer to all the problems here. With regard to the marriage amendment, I do not support it. Uh, I don't believe we want to put something like this into our Constitution. I, I, I just uh, the liberty, we have liberty in this country, and by golly, if we're going to put something like that in the Constitution, we're restricting some fundamental liberty. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Hall, next question, please. Yeah, thanks, Roy. How would you describe a um, healthy, good relationship <coughs> between the state of Minnesota and our, our Indian people, not just the tribal governments, but uh, Indian communities? Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. Uh, Purcell. 
Let me make sure I understand the question. How, how would I describe the relationship between healthy, the state? Healthy and appropriate relationship between the state and tribal governments and tribal communities. Well, some days it's good, some days it's not so good. I would say it's, it's uh, tenuous. Uh, uh, I've uh, had the good fortune of, uh, of working on Leech Lake Reservation for 34 years. So I've been around tribal government uh, and more than just the Leech Lake government. Um, I believe that uh, the, the process has evolved. Uh, and I mean, go back to... Uh, any people got the right to vote in 1924. I mean, there's been a suffrage that's happened here, and uh, you may recall. I recall my first racing partner, Lawrence Wadena, telling me stories out there in a canoe, and we're out there racing, how he come back from WW2, he was a CB over in Japan when they were mining the harbors before they dropped the bomb. Come back from WW2, and he couldn't go in the bars to drink as an Indian man. And, uh, and I could hardly believe some of those things, but it was true. So we've really evolved and coming forward. And the government-to-government -government relationships have, have uh, uh, been improved, to say the least. Uh, Cass County uh, and the Leech Lake Tribe, I think, is, a, is an example I would hold up as one where the county and the tribe have come together to do many good projects, especially in the last 8, 10, 12 years, and really working together. And I've been involved in a number of these projects, and I'm quite proud of it. So I, I think depending on the issue, the relations are good or they're a little bit tenuous and uh, we still can improve. Uh, I think we've shown we can get along uh, and live in this Northwoods uh, as uh, natives and non-natives, uh, but we have to listen. We have to listen really hard and that's something that uh, is difficult on some days for many people. Thank you, sir. Mr. Howes. I'll echo what uh, John said with regard to Cass County. They've been working very, very hard at their relationship with uh, Leech Lake Tribal Government. And I think they've, uh, uh, both of them have done a great job. Um, I can't speak for the BIA because I, I don't know how that relationship works and how well it is. But usually if there are issues, it's usually with the federal government. Uh, and I know that Cass County has worked well together. The court system has worked well with uh, drug violations and things like that. I think right now the biggest, hottest issue uh, is uh, locally with uh, one of the uh, stations, well, maybe several stations on the reservation or owned by the reservation are selling a, a cigarette brand, I think it's called Seneca, that's made by a tribe in New York, and they're not charging uh, the taxes that you would normally charge, so they're like half the price of uh, any other cigarette sold which if that's one of their most serious issues for the time being, I would say we're doing a pretty good job. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Purcell, any rebuttal? No, thank you. Okay, Mr. Haas. All right, then we go move on to our next question from Mr. Wyman. According to recent census data, much of your district has a higher poverty rate uh, in comparison to the rest of the state. If elected, what would you do to help create jobs and bring jobs to the area? Thank you, Mr. Wyman. Mr. Howes. That's the first time I've heard that, Dennis. Uh, with the new district, it's difficult to get everything, uh, all that information uh, as fast as you need it, but that's very interesting. I know my old district, 4B, had pockets of great wealth and pockets of poverty, so it was always difficult to, to make all that work. But uh, I hate to say that, but jobs is, is, is a big issue, jobs. Uh, we need to create more jobs uh, at a living wage, not something that's uh, $7.50 an hour, or, but something that's over $10, maybe $12 an hour. That would help a great deal. Um, we don't have a lot of manufacturing in, in our area, but we have some of the best companies. Uh, Man Lake Bee Supply uh, in Hackensack started as a small company. It's rather large. I think it's the largest uh, beekeeper company uh, making company in North America. Uh, CAVCOM in Walker uh, does special things with hearing aids in the construction industry where there's a lot of noise. They're growing, they're doing a great job. I know that the Cass County Econo Economic Development Corporation uh, does a fantastic job with finding uh, places where someone that wants to start a business 
can start a business, find a building, find the funds, find, find the way through the maze of, of creating a business and making it work and being successful. And I think they've done a great job. Uh, Hunt Technologies in Pine River has been part of the job zone. Uh, they've done very well, although it's my understanding now that the Department of Economic Employment is uh, having issues with the job zone and some of the language and uh, that was done years ago and we have to fight that battle. But uh, create more jobs uh, in this area, provide more jobs and tourism and keep tourism up there. Keep our lakes clean and, uh, and plenty of walleyes in the lakes and we'll continue our tourism. Thank you, sir. Mr. Purcell. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, you know, I'm just going to take off a little bit on, uh, on the last statement there by Representative Howes and that the, really the, the fundamental uh, um, job creator, if you will, in northern Minnesota is our environment. And uh, um, here in the, the lakes of woods and trees, and um, and we we have to work really hard to keep uh, our environment in a, in a clean enough for folks to to want to come up here and recreate. And uh, and if we do, we have that uh, uh, forever. And and that's you know that's probably why most of us live around here. And uh, so what we do with job creation needs to be in conjunction with uh, keeping a clean environment. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and certainly uh, there are some small manufacturing uh, opportunities I think we can take advantage of. Uh, as uh, I'm sure many uh, legislators do, you're always on the, on the lookout for uh, opportunities to, uh, to bring jobs into the district, and I'm no different. I've been working on a number of things. And uh, 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 renewable energy, segment of our market is uh, is poised for some expansion. And I do believe we're going to see that expansion. Uh, you know, I'd tell a story to some of the rural electric companies that uh, that come and talk to us about, uh, you know, what uh, all the regulations that they have to put up with and everything. I said, you know, when this is all said and done and you see electric cars running around Bemidji, Minnesota and around northern Minnesota and most everybody has one in there in their driveway and they come plug them in every night, you're gonna be smiling all the way to the bank. So uh, that's coming at us. And that's what we need to really uh, focus on, I think, is some renewable energy while keeping it, keeping uh, our environment clean here in Northern Minnesota. We can bring some manufacturing here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Howes, any rebuttal? No, thank you. Mr. Purcell, anything else? No. Okay, then moving on to our next question, Mr. Wagner. A two-part question for you guys. Please describe an attribute you admire most about your opponent, and what is your opponent's biggest weakness? Okay, then Mr. Purcell, I'll go first. Tough question. Can we call it Yeah, um, you know, uh, I, I guess if I was, I, uh, this is, I'm just winging it here, because I, uh, uh, Representative Howes and I have not spent uh, uh, very much time together, but I, uh, I'm very confident that uh, uh, if uh, Representative Howes and I uh, had been in uh, the negotiations uh, to resolve the budget issue, um, I don't think there would have been a government shutdown. Um, I, I truly believe that. I, I think it was... Uh, Republican leadership that uh, that took a hard-nosed stance on some things, and uh, uh, and I just uh, haven't uh, haven't fashioned that uh, that I couldn't sit down over a cup of coffee with uh, many many uh, Republicans and and resolve some really difficult issues. Uh, I uh, prided myself when I went down to St. Paul when I was elected in 2008. I thought I could sit down and have coffee. And I'm a, Old farm boy, I can sit down and have coffee with anybody and and uh, and talk about anything. Um, my rudest awakening down there is that I can't do that, but I I, I believe I can do that with Representative Howes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Howes. Well, John, unfortunately, they changed the rules. Uh, we call it the John Marty Law. Years ago, before I even got there, where you could no longer take a legislator out to dinner. And back then they used to take out 10 Republicans, 10 Democrats, and an issue, let's say it's a fishing issue, 
the one side would explain the issue to those 20 people, mm -hmm. and maybe next week the people that were on the opposite side would take the same, same 10 people out and explain it to them. And you had an opportunity then to actually get to know the other 133 members. It's difficult now. I think it would take the full session, at least last session, we had so many new Republicans come in. Even for me, it took almost the whole session to meet and learn who all these new people were uh, because you don't serve on the same committee. But with uh, how would I compliment John? I would think he's very sincere at heart. I think his passion is there. I think he has the same type of passion that I have. Not that that's great, but I, I think we're on the same level. I guess the only fault uh, I can find in John is he's a Democrat. And I say that in jest, folks. I don't say it in, uh, to be mean, but we just don't agree on a lot of stuff. But then again, we agree on a lot of stuff, so it's difficult, you know. <laughs> Thank you, I Mr. House. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Purcell, any uh, rebuttal? I think we'll leave that dog lay. <laughs> Mr. House, anything else? I will leave the dog lay. All right, leaving that dog lay, then we'll move on to Mr. Hall. All right. Uh, well, uh, health care costs are increasing faster than our ability to pay for it. It's becoming a bigger and bigger chunk of, of the state budget. And um, now that we know the, that the uh, Affordable Care Act is, is legal and how do you think the state should go about addressing the health care costs and the issues uh, that, in terms of insuring everyone in the state? Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. Howes, first, please. You know, I, I'm hoping the state can, but I don't know that states in and of themselves can. I think it's probably a lot's going to fall upon the federal government, which I think is sad that it's going to fall on the federal government. But when my wife and I had our first child, Back in 1966, I was a laborer working in the Twin Cities, belonged to the laborers' union. I was making $3.45 an hour. My wife was in the hospital for five days, had a son, and the bill that I received when we left the hospital was $5 for photographs. There was no copay. It was $5 for photographs. Now, I'm sure delivering babies are pretty much done the same way now than they were then. But five days in the hospital, she had time to recuperate, time to rest. Now uh, women go to the hospital and they're out of there, I believe, in two days, maybe one night, two nights at the maximum. Uh, but another thing also, uh, we were talking in the other room watching the Senate debate and when this question came up, and I was taking a wild uh, stab with um, Bill in the back room about uh, MRI machines and thinking they were fifty dollars to $100,000. Uh, one of your staff looked it up on Google on her iPhone and it's about $500 million for an for a MRI machine. So obviously the, the cost, I don't think you can control the cost cost, the hardware, nor can you control the cost of the surgeon. If we open up the market though to, to more insurance companies that can, can broaden the scope and broaden uh, what you can do and also allow more choice in what type of insurance you purchase. Maybe my wife and I at our age would opt not to have maternity care and we could save a little bit of money. Uh, a million things we could do, but to, in today's day and age, if you're having a heart attack and you need a transplant, you're willing to pony up twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in copays and have your insurance company pay $250,000 for the rest because you want to live. Thank you, sir. Mr. Purcell. Well, health care costs have been going up and up and up for many years, and, and how we choose to deal with that as, as a government. And I, I uh, do believe that we're going to have to have some, uh, uh, some interaction, as we have had with the federal government, in order to be successful. I think all the states are. Um, because the nature of the the costs and insurance companies, et cetera. And I think Minnesota's off to a good start here um, in creating a new exchange, healthcare exchange. Um, but you know, you hear from just about anybody you talk to that's, that's, uh, that's had uh, healthcare issues or is part of a pool. And if they're working for a real small 
company or they work for, uh, uh, you know, a, a small business, a small, small business, uh, they say, gee, wish we could get that, that pool a little bit bigger. The more people in your health care pool, the uh, lower the premiums are, generally speaking. And so that just kind of makes me think, well, why don't we have one big health care pool uh, and, uh, and everybody will be covered. And, and uh, I think we're starting towards that. Uh, if you look at what uh, several of the counties did here, Beltrami being right in the middle of it, I think eight counties joined together for their county workers to be in a larger pool for health care, and that drove the cost down. So what if, uh, what if we had to you know, get that pool as big as we can get it? That's one way to do it. Uh, having these health care exchanges is another. Uh, limiting the profits of insurance companies to 20% as the federal law did, that's another. I mean, 20% profit, that's pretty good profit. Uh, but it was 40, 50% you know, before that. So I think we're headed the right direction. It's going to take us uh, some more years to get it ironed out. Thank you, sir. Mr. Howes, any rebuttal? I would, I would just add that I, I tend to agree with John a little bit about the pools. I, 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 unfortunately, the devil is probably in the details. But uh, when, again, back to when my wife and I had our first child, we had Blue Cross Blue Shield, and, and now it's all these health maintenance organizations, and it seems like if you're the CEO and you retire, you get a $35 million buyout, and that could have uh, certainly taken care of a lot of health care for a lot of people. So. Maybe that's a route to take, uh, get away from doing that. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Anything else? No. Okay, in that case, that's the last of our questions. So you can start by giving us your closing statement. Well, uh, thank you to y'all here, Roy and, and uh, Dennis and Steve and Scott uh, for your questions. Uh, and Lakeland Public TV, this is... Uh, uh, been enjoyable. I uh, uh, you never know how you're going to feel about uh, going into a live debate, and uh, I can I can only say I, I have a sympathetic eye and an ear for those who do live TV regularly. That's uh, um, quite an experience. I uh, want to thank all the folks out there looking tonight and uh, tuning in here, and uh, hopefully we've answered a few questions that you might have had. Um, I do want to. You know, Representative Howes, you, you you talked about a vote that I took, and I I, uh, I, I want to point out a couple of things here because uh, um, you've taken some votes too that I I believe need to be mentioned, uh, and I it, it, just things that I didn't vote for, things that you did and I didn't, and and uh, some of these you may recall, maybe you won't, but uh, I didn't recall a vote that you said that I took, so. But you know, you, there was a bill, and it was uh, your your friend, uh, Representative Rukavina, that brought it on uh, on uh, deer baiting, and uh, it went down 108 to 17. You voted for that, I didn't. Uh, you voted uh, yes on a Draskowski bill uh, to privatize public waters in Minnesota. It went down 51 to 74. I voted against that. And there were two ward bills on aquatic invasive species to get tougher on them, and you voted against them. And that really surprised me. And uh, uh, honestly surprised a number of other people too, because uh, we need to get tougher on aquatic invasive species, and uh, that's something I'm really committed to do. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, sir. Mr. Howes, your closing statement, please. Three I remember, John. The first one I don't, Rick Levina won. 17 votes. I don't recall that one, but uh, surprised that I did vote with Graskowski on something, but that's for another day. Uh, thank you to Lakeland Public Television, Bemidji Pioneer, and Scott Hall with the radio folks. Thank you to our one, two, three cameraman. I'm not sure what the other guy does with the laptop, but he's here. Uh, thank you for this facility, and I'm going to say that I, I, I really believe, and I'm, my hope is there, that two years from now, Neither one of us will be here because there will be a new facility built where we'll have a new studio and that's where the debates will take place and it's my hope that that happens. Very pleased to, to be the chief author of that. John was on the bill also um, and I think uh, we worked very hard for many years to get that for Lakeland Public Television. 
and I'm proud to say that I, I helped. And I think John should take some pride in that too. We uh, do enjoy public television. I hope the folks at home got the information they needed. And uh, I do enjoy what I do. I think I'm good at it. I think I'm fair. I work well with other people. And politics is a people business. Above everything else, it's a people business. You need to get along with the Democrats and the Republicans and the independents. And uh, I would ask on November 6th for your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. House. Mr. Purcell, Mr. House, thank you very much for your willingness to come out and share your thoughts with the voters. Uh, thank you to the panelists for your questions, and thank you to the viewers for being willing to spend your time to become more educated in, in time for the, the uh, election. And as far as the gentleman with the uh, laptop, you can read what he has to say to War Morning's Pioneer, because that's what he's doing here. Uh, and uh, if you would uh, stay tuned, at 9 o'clock, we will have our final debate of this evening uh, and with House District 5B candidates, uh, Ms. Carolyn McElfatrick, the Republican, and Mr. Tom Anselk, the Democrat. We hope you'll join us for that. Thank you.